Loop on the Third, The Fuma Conspiracy, also known in Japan as Plot of the Fuma Clan, is the first OVA in the Lupin series initially released in December 1987, marking the 20th anniversary of the manga. While it received the short theatrical run beginning on December 26th, it wasn't long before Fuma Conspiracy received a video release, hitting stores on April 5th, 1988. The general consensus seems to be that in Japan, this is considered a film, while elsewhere, it's often labeled as an OVA, and that latter distinction is what we'll be going with for this series. And the debate over its classification is certainly not its only controversy, as right from the beginning, this was going to be a contentious project. Not necessarily because of the content, but because of details surrounding its production, beginning work under the title Goemon Murasaki Henka, loosely translated to Goemon Changes Purple. Some new blood took charge of the project, with Makoto Naito, who also wrote for Kamen Rider, penning the script, and Masayuki Ozeki, whose credits include episodes of Space Pirate Captain Harlock, Merkin Awakens Romance, and Kirby Right Back At Ya in the director's chair. Telecom worked on the animation, and the artists and production staff were all either loop on veterans like Yasuo Otsuka, who took on a supervisory role, or were fans of the series, which by this time was celebrating its 20th anniversary. That might be why Lupin donned the green jacket again, a celebration of Lupin's original colors from over 15 years ago. Now, having a dedicated crew is one thing, but having the funds necessary to pull it off is another, and TMS was certainly not in a good financial position as this was being made. A lot of these issues can likely be traced to Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, which shared a number of animation staff with Fuma Conspiracy, but was going through a turbulent production cycle. The story of Little Nemo is worthy of its own video, honestly, but the salient points are that TMS had sunk tons of cash over the previous couple of years to get it made. It bounced between multiple collaborators in both the East and the West, with legends like George Lucas, Brad Bird, Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, Ray Bradbury, the Sherman Brothers, and Osamu Dezaki all contributing to the movie at some point in time, and yet, it still wasn't finished. Partially because of its rising costs, TMS had to scale back other projects, and Fuma Conspiracy was affected heavily, necessitating the removal of some essential elements. TMS couldn't afford Yuji Ono, for example, and none of his compositions would appear either. It also influenced the setting, as TMS wasn't able to send its team out that far to do research, so they instead set the OVA inside their native country of Japan. The biggest change, however, are the new voice actors. If you've heard anything about Fuma Conspiracy, it's probably that it doesn't have the same cast as before, since TMS wasn't willing to shell out the budget to hire back the regulars. I've heard that they were the highest paid voice actors in Japan at the time, and if TMS was looking to shrink its expenses, they would unfortunately be a top candidate for replacement. There is another theory that TMS wanted to create a different version of Lupin, though this isn't as well substantiated. The only concrete evidence I could find was Yasuo Otsuka saying as such in an interview with Takeshi Ikemoto in 2004. Whatever the reason, it was a decision from the higher-ups at TMS, and while Monkey Punch had to give his approval, he had no further control over the situation, though he did request that TMS contact the original voice actors and obtain their permission. TMS did not contact the original voice actors and obtain their permission, and they were never informed about the reason behind their casting aside. Apparently, a producer at TMS, who was Monkey Punch's contact, either continually deferred his order to communicate with the actors, or left the company shortly after Fuma Conspiracy released. Accounts differ on exactly what happened, but when the original cast heard the news, they took it very poorly. Goemon actor Makio Inoue called it a rebellion of the creator, and when Lupin actor Yasuo Yamada found out, he was furious, and believed that Monkey Punch was responsible for the change. The story goes that Yamada called Monkey Punch one night after finding out and blew up at him in a drunken rage, and unfortunately, it caused a rift in their relationship that was never resolved. When memorializing Yamada at his funeral, Monkey Punch apparently broke down in tears as he never knew if Yamada ever forgave him for what was, in actuality, just a misunderstanding. But in the end, a loop on adventure was still made, finished around the end of June 1987, but not being released until six months later. TMS gave it a limited theatrical release starting on December 6, 1987, apparently to try and recoup some of the costs of production, and then it received a wider video release on April 5th, 1988. <laughs> <laughs>
Unfortunately, because of the changes in voice actors and composer, Japanese audiences mostly dismissed this film, sending angry letters to TMS and the new actors, demanding the original crew be brought back. TMS complied for the next project and wouldn't replace the cast again except for deaths and retirements, but for many in Japan, this one stands out as Lupin's cursed black sheep. But in the West, and for some retroactively overseas as well, it has a more favorable reputation as many have taken a shine to its animation quality and its fond sense of adventure. A lot of people praise this as a worthy little Lupin project, and I'm right alongside them. I'll explain why, but first, let's go over the story. Fuma Conspiracy begins with Goemon about to marry Murasaki Suminawa, a young woman of the Suminawa clan. Fun fact, Murasaki means purple in Japanese, and that's the origin of that working title in case you were wondering. Anyway, the wedding ceremony is interrupted by ninjas from the Fuma clan, who are after an urn which reveals the location of a treasure hidden by the Suminawas. Goemon chases after them alongside the rest of the Lupon crew, eventually heading out on a hunt for the ancient treasure of the Suminawa clan after rescuing Morasaki from their clutches. With the Fuma hot on their trail, led by the boss, who doesn't have a name, Lupon, Goemon, and the rest of our heroes find themselves in their crosshairs, as well as Zenigatas. Before the plot began, Zenigata witnessed what he believed to be Lupon's death and dedicated his life to becoming a monk and praying for his salvation, a holdover from a scrapped plot point in Mystery of Mamo, funnily enough. But once he learns that Lupon is alive and kicking, he of course heads right back into his normal routine. Another simple story this time around, formed around the classic Lupon formula of Lupon wants treasure, bad guys want treasure, Lupon and bad guys square off, Zenigata chases after them both, and a bunch of shenanigans along the way. Nothing too special on the foundational side, but the surface details give it a different edge. The Fuma clan has appeared in other Lupon media before, and many character elements of the main cast feel almost like a hodgepodge from various projects like Part 1, Part 2, and Castle of Cagliostro. Somehow, by adding these small references to all these Lupon adventures, it has its own mood with a blend of action, adventure, and treasure hunting, with less mystery and intrigue. You could say it feels a little stock in that regard, not having a defining element that helps it stick out. The bad guys aren't deep, the treasure isn't super unique, and some scenes clearly take inspiration from things Lupin has already done. Just on the basic plot level, it's good but not quite outstanding, with a few problems here and there that, honestly, come down more to nitpicking than anything. As a 73 minute OVA, it boils the scenario down to its essential points without spending too much time on any particular moment but it doesn't flow quite as nicely as previous Lupin movies, and the scenes aren't as well connected together as they should be. Mamo and Cagliostro definitely felt better planned out, and while Fuma's scenes are usually executed well, the script just doesn't properly bridge them together. This is also the first big example, outside of TV episodes, where Lupin doesn't have the spotlight to himself, as this time, Goemon becomes just as much a main character, perhaps even more so. Right from the beginning, Goemon's relationship with Morosaki is driving the plot forward, bringing all the characters together in Japan and giving the villains a way to leverage themselves in the treasure hunt. Morosaki, another early example of a Lupon girl, brings a more childlike perspective to the events, being more of a free spirit than the traditionalist Goemon, and that's a nice dynamic, but her addition is something I'm a little more mixed on. She is definitely not a bad character, I really like that she pulls her own weight in the adventure, becoming a valuable asset to Lupin and Goemon with her knowledge of her clan's traps and expertise. And I also want to give credit to our actor Mayumi Sho, also known for Chi Chi from Dragon Ball, who does a good job with the role, giving us a cheery, youthful performance. But it's her romance with Goemon that bothers me, as she's clearly too young for Goemon for a romance plot. I don't know how young exactly, but she looks no older than 14 at most. And before you comment about the age of consent in Japan, I'm not talking about how legal it is. I am talking about how weird it is for an adult like Goemon to be in a romance with a girl who is, by all accounts, still a kid. I don't know enough about Japan's clan system or the history of traditional marriages in the country, so I can't comment on how accurate it is from that perspective. What bugs me specifically is Goemon's reaction to her advances. It would be one thing for him to completely rebuff her or ignore her. Then you could just call it a one-sided crush. But Goemon is clearly flustered by it in a way that suggests he reciprocates the feelings in some way, which doesn't feel right. If Morisaki was older, I'd be perfectly fine with this romance subplot. They've got chemistry as people, and when you remove the age issue, it's believable how they would connect. 
But this appears to be taking place once the Lupin gang has done a lot of jobs together, with Goemon's marriage signifying him trying to settle down, so it sticks out as a weird issue. It's not exactly a damning problem for me, but it's not the only one I have with the characters. Goemon and Lupin are absolutely fine, perhaps a little bit generic, but you get exactly what you want with them, and anyone who wants Goemon to enter the spotlight will definitely be satisfied here. Of course, I love me some Zenigata, and there's some incredible moments with old Pops in this one, with that same dedicated attitude we all know and love, even if he isn't that important in the grand scheme of the plot. Some of the newer additions aren't too bad either, romance problems aside, I do like Morasaki quite a bit, and her grandfather, whom I also don't think has a name, is a solid addition as well. Where I find a lot of faults are with the rest of the Lupin gang and the villains. Fujiko doesn't have much to do here, apparently she had a bigger role during production as she was originally the one to be married, but when this was given to Goemon, Fujiko was sidelined as a result. Like, she finds this key in the Suminawa clan's urn and you'd think it'd be used to open some lock. Which it does, but that lock has already been destroyed before Fujiko even finds the key, so what's the point? Jigen's got it even worse. It feels like the writers actively had to invent situations for him to be in, because he's otherwise very disconnected from what's happening. He's more in line with Miyazaki and Takahata's Jigen, where he's a bit goofier and more clueless, but here it inhibits any development that he could have had. As for the villains, they're not terrible, but I wish we knew more about them. Kazumi is fine as the double agent acting as a police officer, but the other Fuma lackeys don't really do it for me, and the boss especially feels like a big letdown. He's got as much depth as a B-grade part 2 villain, and over a longer bit of time, that's not enough to sustain my interest. Intimidating, but not memorable. Again, my issues with the story are mostly just bothersome points. It's still a solid loop on adventure overall, and one that keeps up the fun all through its runtime. While it might not have much unique to offer in the story department, one area where it absolutely shines is how it looks. TMS might have been tighter with the budget, but they did not skimp on the animation. Telecom staff always create great results, and even for a smaller project like this, it rivals and sometimes even surpasses works like Cagliostro. Character movements are very fluid, losing the rigidity of the television shows completely and letting the characters bounce around with plenty of speed and momentum. It's never too cartoony or realistic, finding appropriate times to bring out both natural and unnatural motion or poses. Kazuhide Tomonaga was the animation director here, and his list of credits is substantial, working as a key animator for several Studio Ghibli movies, Little Nemo, and on several Lupin projects, including Part 2, Mamo, and Cagliostro. He's still working for Lupin 2, most recently on the Koiki trilogy and Part 5, and he and the other animators did a fantastic job here. I want to highlight the car chases in particular, a loop on staple which Fuma absolutely nails, some of the best in the series. Despite how bonkers these chases can get, the best ones always have a semi-confined nature that sells the illusion just enough so you're enthralled with it and not chiding it as ridiculous. Yasuo Otsuka described the transition between the ordinary and extraordinary as a key element of why loop on car chases are so good, and these ones excel in this regard. The movements of the car, not just across the terrain, but also the rotations, bumps, pitching and rolling, etc., it gives the scenes that much more intensity. It doesn't play by our rulebook of physics, but it plays by some rulebook of physics. Every bit is carefully constructed to not just be great to look at, but consistent. Like, obviously a Fiat would never actually be able to do stuff like this, but the attention to detail in positioning the car on each frame to give it a defined method of movement, even if it isn't realistic, helps make it feel like it could be possible within the confines of this world. There's plenty to love in the art style as well, which goes for a more classical look in its designs and environments. The look of the characters is softer and more grounded overall, taking inspiration from Part 1 and Cagliostro specifically. Makes sense, as this is the return of Green Jacket Lupin, and Otsuka is once again involved. It also makes sense when you consider the art director Shichiro Kobayashi, who was also the art director for Cagliostro, as well as the 1997 Berserk series, Angel's Egg, and the Golgo 13 movie. Surprisingly, the environments caught my eye a lot more on this rewatch than they ever did before. Japan makes for a more exotic setting for Lupin, as even though he is a Japanese creation and has traveled there often enough, he usually lays down roots in Europe or other Western countries. But obviously the animators and designers were familiar with Japan, so they could easily replicate the towns, landscapes, and architecture without much research. 
They didn't have to go out and study foreign landmarks or surroundings, they could just take a short trip to a nearby street or field and take a quick look around, envisioning Lupin and the chaos he could bring to their home country. So in many ways, it's a familiar yet unique adventure, though some parts definitely carry their own flair. The soundtrack was done by Kiyoshi Maiarawa, who mostly composes for television commercials, but was given more creative freedom regarding this project, taking a very 80s pop and synth-heavy approach while still maintaining a bit of that jazzy orchestral bend to it. The opening theme, C'est la vie toyuan aide, isn't bad, the song Loop On Is Forever I actually really like just on the saxophone riff alone, and the car chases have some decent accompaniment, but otherwise, I found the soundtrack kinda generic and ill-suited for these scenes. It's not bad on its own, yet it sometimes conflicts with the vibes of the story as it's being told. Thankfully, I can at least appreciate that the replacement actors took to these characters in their own way and didn't just ape the regular crew. It seems like these actors weren't aware of the situation behind their hiring, at least initially, and they felt bad about the whole affair after finding out. The cast interviews on the Discotech DVD seem mostly to be the actors wondering if it's okay for them to be taking on these roles, hoping that fans wouldn't be too angry. Many of the new actors did have bit parts in previous Lupin projects, so they had somewhat of an idea of what to bring to the table and attempted to make these characters their own. Toshio Furukawa plays Lupin, also notable for characters like Ataru Moroboshi from Urusei Yatsura and Piccolo from Dragon Ball, as well as dubbing actors like Billy Crystal and Terry Gilliam. Apparently Furukawa denied the role at first, but his manager changed his mind, and despite getting a lot of flack and even angry letters from fans for taking on the role, he is proud to have worked on the series. I personally think he sounds a little too young, and while Furukawa does do an excellent younger loop on, that doesn't seem to be what the story is going for, and it's a little distracting. I have the same feelings about Goemon's actor, the late Kaneto Shiozawa, famous for his roles as Grey Fox in Metal Gear Solid and the dubbed voice for Luke Skywalker in the original Star Wars trilogy. Again, perhaps a little too soft for Goemon, but it's nice to see that he gets the main billing in a longer production, and Shiozawa does a creditable job. Banjo Ginga does a pretty solid job as Jigen, with his deeper voice fitting well, not surprising given his work on Cyborg 009 and Hunter x Hunter. This also marks the only time that Kiyoshi Kobayashi didn't voice Jigen until he officially retired from the role in 2021, a testament to his longevity as this character. Mami Koyama's Fujiko is another solid performance that is less flirtatious than Eiko Masuyama's voice, but considering she's pretty toned down for this one, that makes sense. You may recognize her as Kei from Akira and the adult Chiyoko Fujiwara from Millennium Actress, and her take on one of anime's most famous ladies is respectable. I'm less enthusiastic about the new Zenigata, voiced here by the late Seizo Kato, the actor of Megatron from Transformers. His voice feels a little strained with some of these lines, but as Kato himself said, Zenigata requires a lot of screaming, so I don't envy his position. It's not an easy job to pull off, and he does just fine. Also, bonus fun fact, Koichi Yamadera, the current voice of Zenigata, actually has a small role in Fuma Conspiracy as a police officer, the first of his few small parts in the series, before officially taking over for Goro Naya in 2011, which is pretty cool. Overall, the new Japanese cast are satisfying enough replacements, and if these actors worked on more Lupin projects, I'm sure they would have developed their takes on the characters more, and possibly become a solid secondary team, but that's pure speculation. Regardless of what you think of the new Japanese cast, though, I think most can agree that the English dub is pretty lackluster. This dub was produced by Coastal Studios, a North Carolina-based company founded in 1993 by Scott Hull, who also directed the studio's dubs. This was one of the first projects the company created for Animago, and the dubbing crew on this one also have roles in other Coastal dubs, such as Blue Submarine No. 6, Crusher Joe, Bow the Visitor, and You're Under Arrest. Released in 1995, this dub was published under the name Rupon the Third because of those dang copyright issues, though later releases like the discotheque version do carry the Loop on the Third name. While the script is perfectly fine, the voices unfortunately just don't fit the characters at all. Rupon's voice by Robin Robertson is especially annoying. The inflection is all over the place and it makes him sound way too snobby and shaky, and Mark Franklin as Goemon also isn't that great as if he's not that invested in the role. As for the others, Sean P. O'Connell's Jigen is just not a great performance, and Michelle Seidman as Fujiko isn't bad, but not outstanding. Mark Matney is definitely trying as Zenigata, but he doesn't rise above just being passable outside of a few great screams. 
I'd avoid this dub if at all possible. While it's not the worst thing ever, it's far from the best way to watch Fuma Conspiracy, and unlike the Frontier dub of Mamo, it isn't fun to laugh at how bad it is. But I do recommend watching this one in Japanese, as while Fuma Conspiracy is maybe a little by the numbers and some elements could have been more fleshed out, it has such a thrilling pace and attitude that it's worth checking out. It's not groundbreaking, and maybe the removal of the typical actors and composer might bother you, but if you're a fan of the sense of adventure that Lupin brings, this will definitely appeal to you. And again, the animation is spectacular. You can accuse Fuma Conspiracy of being many things, but boring it ain't. And at just 73 minutes, it goes by at a very brisk pace while still allowing you to soak the journey in. Fuma Conspiracy also represents a bit of a stopping point for many Lupin traditions, though more so on the production side. Telecom was transitioning towards primarily Western projects at this time and would only work on one further Lupin film through the 90s and 2000s. This was also the last Lupin project done while TMS founder Yutaka Fujioka was still at the company as he retired after Little Nemo was released. And this signified the last big screen Lupin project for eight years, as Lupin would strictly be found on television until 1995. We're finally entering the era of the Lupin TV special, starting in 1989 with Bye Bye Lady Liberty. But that's for next time. For now, if you enjoyed this video, then give it a like, leave a comment, and be sure to subscribe and click that bell to be notified when new videos go live. If you want to help support this channel, you can either subscribe to the Cloud Connection Patreon page for at least a dollar a month, or leave a super thanks comment down below by clicking that heart button. Until next time, this is Cloud Connection, signing off.